Hi, everyone. <laughs> when I was 19, I started what I thought would amount to an impactful but very small company. I had started or organized other projects and activities in the past, and I thought I knew a little bit about effective leadership. Starting and running a company is like nothing I had ever done before. There are no end dates, no deadlines, and you can say goodbye to leaving 5 p.m. anywhere. Every day, I try to make my company the best it can be, because the alternative is it not existing anymore. A good week makes me want a good month, which makes me want an even better quarter. Quarters become years if you are that good and that lucky. Well, when I started Reborn, I didn't know exactly what I was getting into, but I had a simple vision in mind to give consumers an upcycling option for their sentimental clothing. I wanted clothing everywhere to get out of the backs of closets and back to being used. I just had no idea that there are some very large closets in the world, <laughs> and we've grown to something larger than I had ever imagined was possible. But there's a little bit more that all started in those eight months when I had an idea and was trying to figure out how could I turn this into a profitable, bus profitable business. What I noticed is that sustainable fashion was, and still is, largely a niche market. Whereas local and organic grocery, op grocery options have successfully infiltrated our average Trader Joe's or Whole Foods or Lowe's Foods, um, sustainable fashion really had not. It normally comes with a heavy price tag and is inaccessible to the average consumer. What made a consumer want to buy a sustainable product? There's a known phenomenon happening today that consumers are choosing to buy sustainably more than ever before. But when I looked deeper into it, what I found was that consumers aren't necessarily motivated by a primary factor of sustainability. While it may come into their purchasing decision, it's still not the first thing that they're looking for. And today, if you're looking for a sustainable product, whether it be sustainable fashion or a sustainable product in sustainable fashion, you're going to have to do a lot more research than the average consumer would to find one of those small, limited companies online or even more rare in a retail store. I recently watched a video by Kristen Heiss, the VP of strategy at EPAM Continuum, and she shared three primary reasons why consumers would choose to buy a sustainable product. The first reason is to save money. You might already do this. You might choose to take the bus or ride your bike to work or to class because it's more convenient for you and you didn't want to pay for a parking pass on campus or maybe you don't want to buy car insurance or pay for gas every week or month. But you're not necessarily taking into your primary purchasing decision that it's the negative impact that driving a car has on our environment. It's totally fine, but it's just fact. A second reason you might choose to buy a sustainable product is to have a healthier lifestyle. So you might choose one of those readily accessible local organic grocery food options, but it's probably because it's going to taste a lot better and it will be better for you. You're not necessarily taking into effect that if you buy from a local grower, it probably used less chemicals in the growing process and didn't travel halfway around the world to get to you. And a third reason is for a higher quality. So you might actually choose to buy that vegan leather briefcase or a backpack that was hand-stitched by a woman in Ethiopia. But again, the reason is that it will last longer and therefore save you more money. You're not necessarily taking into effect uh, or into your thought process that the livestock industry has a negative impact on our planet. I think there's another reason why you would buy a sustainable product, and it was something I was willing to try out. If you haven't seen these quirky little shoes walking around your campus, which I hope you have, um, these are all birds, and they're actually made from sheep wool from Merino Sheep in New Zealand. It's a pretty cool company, and they have successfully infiltrated the mainstream fashion market. They've done this in quite a few ways. But first, their primary branding campaign or marketing strategy is not around the fact that they're almost the first sustainable shoes out there. Their primary campaign is, we make the world's most comfortable shoes. They're selling a great product. But they've done an additional thing. And what they've done is what other sustainable companies have done who've successfully passed a niche, limited amount of individuals. They tell a great story around their products. They've partnered with major brands like Shake Shack out of San Francisco where they started. They've even started a campaign where you can meet your shoes or type in a code of your specific shoes and find out how it came from raw materials to the sneakers that arrived at your front door. 
It's customizing for the masses, and companies are finding unique ways to make this happen. At Reborn, we take a different approach, too. While companies are spending millions of dollars figuring out the best technology to turn raw material or plastic water bottles into shoes or flats, shout out to Rothy's, um, we take a different approach. So we use the textile in its current state and make it into something even more valuable. What I took a chance on is that there's something in your possession that's already more valuable to you than sheep from New Zealand or plastic water bottles. It's enshrined in the flannel that your grandfather wore every day on the farm or the high school soccer t-shirts that characterize those years for you. It's your memories, and it's in every piece of clothing that we wear. It's from the year that your baby grew up, their first year. It's the t-shirt that you wore when your husband asked you on your first date in college. It's your memories, and if you've ever given away these clothing, you know what I mean when you say that you can't give them back, not in that form. But maybe before reborn, there wasn't really something you could do, a good way to get that out of the supply closet, out of the storage, and back to being used. Recently, just recently, um, a movement has started, maybe in the past five years, called Clothes Aren't Trash. People are starting to wake up and really care about the fact that not only does clothing have a sentimental point of view, but an environmental asset too. It took so much water, energy, and labor to make the textile in its current state. And at Reborn, we can use far less resources to upcycle it or turn it into something new. Instead of breaking it down into fibers and starting all the way from scratch, which is often a far more expensive process, out of a small cut and sew facility in Raleigh, North Carolina, we take t-shirts and give it new value. This past fall, the company got a lot larger. It took some convincing, but between the summer of my sophomore and junior year of college, I brought on investors from Raleigh, moved into a cut and sew facility, and hired a core team of sewers, product development designers, and social media um, individuals. And so this past fall, we received licensing for NC State, where we started transforming hundreds of surplus branded apparel, whether it was surplus event t-shirts, athletic uniforms, ambassador polos, and more, started transforming that into tablet sleeves, golf club head covers, travel cases, duffel bags, coolers, you name it. <laughs> now these products are selling in the university bookstore, local fan shop, the red and white store, and back to departments as premium incentives and giveaways. And NC State was just the beginning. We've started fulfilling orders for UNCW, ECU, and don't worry, there's conversations happening with our friends in blue down the road. <laughs> We started conversations with major brands about their thousands of yards of textile waste that come about each year. It's innate in the manufacturing process of textiles. And there's more we can do in that sector too. But the fact is, there's just a lot of waste. Before Reborn, these shirts might have been donated, mailed across to countries in Africa who are now starting to refuse them, or in general taken out of that community. What we've been able to do at Reborn is introduce a circular system for clothing and surplus branded apparel. Now, when that event is outdated, when the athletic uniforms are replaced with new ones, instead of just being sent off campus, they're actually reintroduced back to those same fans who were there cheering when the touchdown was scored or who attended that event, maybe even TEDx UNC. <laughs> The textile industry tells a very tangible story of textile waste. We have had no problem finding an enormous amount. The textile industry is the second largest polluter in the world, second only to oil. And some of you may be shocked by this, some of you may have known. Um, there's only some statistics even released about the amount of textile waste, so I think the problem is much worse than we would imagine. The EPA estimates that around 13 million tons of clothing is thrown away by Americans each year. That's just on the consumer side. Again, innate to the manufacturing process, when you're cutting patterns out of a large bolt of fabric, there will always be textile waste. If there's a misprint or a bad run, it's going to be tossed unless dealt with responsibly. A couple weeks ago, I had the opportunity to attend, um, to attend Tex World, a global textile conference in New York City. And my business and par partner and I were walking around, around 2,000 companies were there from manufacturers to brands and everything in between. And some really exciting things were happening around sustainable fashion, about five companies. 
um, all startups. <laughs> and we had an opportunity to go visit one of those companies called Fab Scrap. They're largely serving the New York market. And they work with around 250 designers and manufacturers to collect their textile waste every week. They essentially offer a pickup service. So we went into their facility, and you, when you walk in, you're confronted with an enormous pile, bags and bags and bags of textile waste. And I looked at the woman who was walking us around, and I said, you're only two years old. What was being done with this before you? And she took a second, and she said, nothing that we found. So if there's that problem in New York that is only being dealt with in the past two years, you can imagine just how large it is on a global scale. But that's not all I want to know about sustainability or sustainable fashion. I want to know who is making my clothing or my products. What does their work look like? What does their life look like as a result of that work? You may have been told this is just the way it is. And so have I by many brands. But it doesn't have to be. I assure you, sewing can be sexy. If you're thinking, how is this 21-year-old, a junior at NC State, able to turn an entire industry on its head? The answer is that I'm not transforming an entire industry. But by trying to change my small corner of the world, by deciding that even with my inexperience and limited knowledge, that I was going to do something about it, that I was going to take my idea and put it out there, I fell among the support of my community members, people who were ready to support something with a powerful story. So I'd encourage you to do the same. When I started college, I thought I was going to go to law school, but sometimes life reaches out and grabs you. 